Welcome to the Learning Reinvented podcast brought to you by myself, Katie Gordon, and the team at The Learning Effect. There are lots of learning podcasts out there, so we wanted to do something slightly different. This week we're discussing sales training, but as you'll hear, it's not what you may expect. So I'm delighted to welcome Dennis Roman to the podcast. Thank you for joining me, Dennis. Would you like to introduce yourself to our listeners? Thank you very much, Katie. Um, and I'd be glad to introduce myself to, to, to your audience. You and I have already met a few times. Uh, hello, everyone. Dennis Roman. I'm going to stress right up front. That's not Dennis Rodman. So if you start looking for me, you're going to get a lot of Dennis Rodman by mistake. So Dennis Roman here. And I'm the founder of a company called Roman's Numbers. I was going to pick Roman numerals, but that was already taken. So I picked a brand called Roman's Numbers. And my quick history, I think, might be of interest to you. Instead of repeating all the companies I ever worked for, I like to present it this way. I have a career that I would split into a pie chart of thirds, right? One third of this, one third of that. Okay, now within those thirds, I've had a third of my career working directly for banks, brokers, and insurance companies for many years, big firms. And during that period of time, I've had a lot of people approach me in the field that I'm in now, which is sales and marketing, trying to sell me stuff. But first third was working for banks, brokers, and insurance companies, developing technological solutions of all types to help those firms be better at what they did. The second third is working for consulting companies. Um, consulting companies like KPMG, Pete Marwick, running a consulting business for that firm and others to deliver solutions to banks, brokers, and insurance companies. You're gonna find a lot of banks, brokers, and insurance companies in my history. And then the third third is actually working for big tech companies manufacturing, if you will, or building solutions for banks, brokers, and insurance companies. Um, and those would include HP and Oracle and uh, Tata Consultancy Services. I've also had an opportunity to work for some startup firms too. So I've seen kind of the movie from both ends, big behemoth companies, big technology companies, and smaller startups and what they all go through. Uh, one anecdote here, Katie, that your audience may find of interest is about 10 years ago, I was, I don't know what I was thinking about, but this thought came to mind. And I realized that I had actually had the opportunity to have worked for two people who ran for president of the United States. They weren't running for president when I worked for them. They went on to run for president after I had long left their employ. But uh, I, ran, I worked for uh, Ross Perot at EDS, who went on to run for president. And I worked for Carly Fiorina at HP, who also went on to run for president. Now, in counterpoint to that high mark in my career, I should also mention that I've worked for two individuals who shall remain anonymous for the purpose of this podcast, who ended up in prison. Um, <laughs> one was running a bucket shop, which is a company who sells commodity options but doesn't buy the actual commodities to make delivery on the options when they're executed. And the other was jailed for insider trading. So I've seen some highs and lows. But what is of interest to me, especially, and hopefully, Katie, to your audience, is that across this longest spectrum, one avocation of mine persisted, studying the marketplace and personally buying and selling stocks. It's something that has always interested me and something that continues to get my very active attention today. And it was around 2015 that a light bulb went on in my head that began altering my career path. At that point, a very hot subject was emerging in the marketing area at technology companies. And the word for it was repurpose. For instance, take a customer video that ran 15 minutes and cut it up into slivers or slices and put clips of the video on your website. Or take a white paper 
that someone at the company had written and break it down into a series of meaningful posts on LinkedIn. But for me, the aha moment was, how do I take my relatively mature knowledge of the stock market and repurpose it? That's what really got me going. And I wanted to use that, that experience and bend it to my company's advantage. Not Roman's numbers, I'm talking about the last large tech company that I worked for. And by that, I did not mean to tell my companies how to buy and sell stock, but rather it was how to use the stock market prism to help sales teams better decide which kind of firms to go after and which to avoid. And I hope that's a interesting tease, Katie, for your audience. Yeah, definitely. It sounds like you've got a definite uh, broad background and, and lots of experience. So could you explain in a bit more detail about your business? And, and you mentioned it there briefly, um, Roman's numbers. So can you tell us a little bit more about that um, and what you guys actually do? Sure. So Katie's Roman's numbers, obviously, it's a play on my last name, which is Dennis Roman. I'll remind everybody, not Dennis Rodman. And uh, <laughs> the only reason I keep doing that is I get this all the time. I go to Japan to a hotel and they said, oh, we were thinking it was Dennis Rodman coming in. OK, so Roman's numbers is a play on, obviously. But the accent mark, if you would, is the word numbers. That's what my business is predicated on, numbers. So Roman's numbers has two related complementary but independent value propositions. The first one is what I call windows on Wall Street. These are classes that I run. I should rephrase that. These are workshops that I run. And I run them for technology companies, sales and marketing teams who are selling into the public sector marketplace anywhere in the world. And the numbers part, if you will, are based on analysis of the financial performance of the public companies that people are calling on. Hence, the numbers emphasis. By doing that financial analysis, <clears throat> we have found that it makes a great window, windows on Wall Street, into the financial health, or worse, ill health, of public companies and why the health or ill health might be of interest to technology companies, sales teams, and how it could be of help to the technology companies, marketing teams, to figure out how to message to those companies. So windows on Wall Street, classes that I run for tech, for tech companies. And because they're based on analysis of financial statements, and financial statements everywhere in the world are predicated on generally accepted accounting principles. That means that what I do for a living is applicable all over the planet. Revenue in Greece is the same as revenue in Israel, is the same as revenue in China, is the same as revenue in the United States. It's all revenue. Could have a different name, but it's all revenue. And of course, not everybody applies every rule the same way and generally accepted accounting principles. But by and large, it's a great litmus test to be able to use publicly available information that's standardized all over the world. So in delivering the classes, <clears throat> when the classes would end, very often my audience and the boss in the, in the room would say to me, well, what do I do next? And I said, well, I've just spent several hours with your team teaching them how to hunt, if you will, this isn't farming, this is hunting. I've just taught him how to hunt. Now, if you're not sure what to do next, and if you wanted to, I could help hunt with you and for you. And by that, I don't mean I'm gonna go out on sales calls, but I will, I will, I will, I do study individual stocks for technology companies of any size. The tech company could be a startup or it could be a giant behemoth. I'll analyze public companies on an individual basis and give my recommendations to the sales and marketing teams about which ones to go after, which ones to avoid, which to emphasize, what messages to emphasize, et cetera. And that business has the call sign or the name of 
sales with an edge. So I'm giving an edge to the sales team by working in parallel with them. Again, this will help them narrow the funnel at the top. So those are two my two value propositions and they sit underneath a philosophy. I have an overall philosophy that drives both of those value propositions and that's called CA squared. If you change your arguments, you will change your audience. Historically, what I've noticed is that many technology company sales teams, especially, are quite comfortable talking to their counterparts at the companies they're calling on, meaning they're very comfortable talking to the technology people at the bank or the broker or the manufacturer or the oil company or whatever it is. And again, I should mention my analysis is for all industries, not just for the financial services industries. So whereas they're very comfortable talking to the technology side, they're relatively uncomfortable talking to the business side. And hence my argument, CA square, change your arguments, you'll change your audience. And in so doing, you will begin by making business arguments and you will slowly find yourself or quickly even find yourself talking more to the managing directors of profit centers. And if you're especially fortunate talking to the C-suite of the company that you're calling on, because that's what those folks want to hear. They want to hear business arguments, if you will. Why, in fact, should somebody want to get involved and uh, be doing that kind of work with you, right? Change, change your arguments, you will change your audience. Okay, so I've quickly described windows on Wall Street and sales with an edge. Now, I have a couple of ways for people to experience this, literally no risk whatsoever. And there's two programs I have. One's called the Magic Money Workshops. Because often when I've conducted my workshops, people have actually used the word magic when I've talked about it. I started to incorporate that, the Magic Money Workshops. And essentially those are workshops I give about every three weeks or so, which contain slices of the bigger wall, Windows on Wall Street workshops. So I do a slice. I could one week be talking about uh, stock buyback programs, another week, I could be talking about the industry, the equity analysts and how they could be incorporated into the go-to-market for tech and sales team. So the Magic Money Workshops. And the other one is what I call the, the DDT program. And that stands for Discovery with Dennis on Thursdays. And by that, I mean, if somebody gives me a public company to look at, I'm going to look at it. And about a week later, I'm going to come back with a full report privately to talk to that individual or a couple of people on that team and tell them what I think of that company. So totally free discovery with Dennis on Thursdays in the DDT programs. Okay, so those are my value propositions in a nutshell, Katie, and I hope that uh, that grouping was your, your audience could visualize it and see how those parts fit together. Yeah, definitely. I think I think it sounds really good that you're taking your experience that you've had in the past uh, and obviously put that into into workshops and that you're able to help people. So when your clients are coming to you, what sort of challenges do you think that they're facing, um, especially at the moment in regards to sales and the training of that sales? That's a very topical subject. Uh, painfully, uh, painfully to uh, topical, I should add, Katie, and I'll explain that in a little more detail. Um, budget dollars are scarce. OK, that's like a motherhood's apple pie statement. Budget dollars are always scarce. Budget dollars are never, ever really, really plentiful. That's a resource uh, like time. Time is another resource. And both of those are uh, quite limited, meaning people only have so many bucks to spend and people have only so much time in order to get something done. So those two things, and they often work against each other, right? Because the sooner somebody needs something, more often the more the more it'll cost. So budget dollars are um, are scarce, and often when sales decline, which is exactly what happened in 2023 across many industries, and 
companies want to rein in cost, typically it's marketing in general and sales training in the specific that suffer. And so companies whose sales are declining react often counterintuitively by cutting sales training. I know it doesn't make any sense. You know it doesn't make any sense, but that's often what happens. It's not the same as the price of gas goes up, so you choose to drive less, so you're not spending all that money. No, this is a particular predicament because sales are hurting, and instead of figuring out how to sell better, sales training is often cut. Now, that's one of the largest obstacles that we're facing right now in the sales training world. Another is sales training is, often, is all too often conducted without the sales team's most obvious, potentially impactful partners. And by that, I mean marketing in general and research and communications often are the most overlooked. So the sales planning process is often all too often, and I speak from several decades of experience, is conducted without marketing being in a room, marketing, cooperating on the sales plan, et cetera. It, again, it's, it's a much more blunt instrument than it could be than a sales and marketing team collaborating vigorously together on going into the marketplace. The third challenge I see for the sales training functionality is the market changes more rapidly than the sales curricula can logically and financially keep up. Examples, Katie, how do we sell cloud? Well, before we got done figuring that out, how do we sell blockchain? And before we got done figuring that out, how do we sell internet of things? And before we got done figuring that out, the big 500 pound gorilla came in the room, which is, and now how do we sell or effectively utilize artificial intelligence? Another challenge that happens with sales training is whereas all corporate citizens today are required to accomplish a training, a, you know, various training sessions annually, sexual harassment, safety, risk, Security, DEI, et cetera. Everybody has to do those, everybody. But sales has all this plus. It, all, it also needs to make room for pro professional training regarding its go-to-market efforts. So if sales training is a vital and active function at the company, the sales team has to be taking that on along with everything else. So. In counterpoint, who's telling the legal team or the payroll team or the fulfillment team, et cetera, to be taking extra special classes each year, idiosyncratic to them alone? They're not. It's the sales team. Now, obviously, the list of challenges are many, but the benefits of well-strategized and executed sales training programs reaps significant rewards. But that actually wasn't the question. So. Back to you, Katie. Those are four or five of the large challenges that the sales team is facing. I think that was going to be one of my next questions, but I'll just I'll just add on to what you're saying. I think as soon as organizations do come into kind of challenging times and we're just going into a recession here in the UK, um, I, I think we'll start to see the decrease in, in training. I think that that all, always happens. That's a budget that always gets a hit first. And, and I think having really good, um, robust training um, across all topics is, is really essential and crucial, especially at times like this. But can you to explain some of the benefits of your particular training um, that your clients see? So in my classes, I have a picture of uh, a pile of most, uh, let's say 25, 2023 automobiles. Okay, I want your audience to try to just picture this. So on a slide, there's 25 automobiles. They're all hatchbacks or SUVs. From one from each of the manufacturers goes from Volkswagen up to Porsche and Mercedes and 
and they're all white. You know, all the all the buyers pick white. So if you take the white SUV or hatchback in 2023 from all the major manufacturers and you put them all on one slide, you almost can't tell them apart. Now, they are all different. We know that because all of us have uh, most of almost all of us have a car and we went out and shopped for a car and we bought a car and they're, they're not always going to be white, but they look the same at a certain distance. You have to get closer and closer and closer to the cars before distinguishing features begin to pop out. Okay. Well, I submit that's the way technology companies, sales and marketing teams should view themselves. Because on the other side, customers are viewing us that way. When they see the vendors coming at them, either via RFPs, RFIs that are coming in digitally, and the company has to start evaluating one from another, or they're coming at them for presentations, either on Zoom or at the corporate headquarters, and they come in one at a time, it is quickly it quickly becomes a blur for most buyers to figure out where the distinctions lie. And we break our back trying to make those distinctions obvious to the clients. And that's the right answer. Sales and marketing needs to distinguish themselves from the sales and marketing teams of all the other companies they're going up against. And that is the classic approach. I have a very different take on that. So whereas those same 25 cars all look the same, there is one, there is at least one way that I know of practically to distinguish yourself from the other 24 vendors in one fell swoop. Back to change your arguments, you'll change your audience, CA squared. So most vendors will make a presentation in whatever form, whether it's video or PowerPoint or white paper or uh, the website or, and it goes on and on. And they'll make their points about the goodness of whatever it is they're offering. We have this award from this company. We've been in business for 12 years, for a hundred years. Our solution is running at 30 different manufacturing companies, whatever. And all of that's fine. That's all vital and, and, and appropriate. Problem is the other 10 vendors you're competing against are making the same arguments. And so the audience really starts to blur out. They're going, I don't know if I can listen to one more presentation because it's just one presentation may be much slicker than the other presentation. But now let me get to this punchline that I have about how to distinguish yourself. First off, before you go to the client site, you got to do a lot of research. And I mean financial research. You got to know at least as much about that company, certainly as much as you know about your own company, but you really need to dig in and do your research. So imagine this, Katie. Sales team comes into the corporate boardroom and they're going to make a presentation. Typically, it's going to be by PowerPoint. Okay. And the first slide is, hi, I'm Dennis Roman. I'm from Roman's Numbers. I want to thank you for allowing us to be here today. We're delighted to be here. And I want to share something with you that I think or I'm hoping you're going to find of interest. And that is, I know I'm here because I want you to pick me. I want you to pick my solution. I want you to pick my company. So that's self-evident. But I'm really here today because I've studied your company for the last two months. And I've studied your direct competitors for the last two months. And I've chosen you to go after, not the other guys. I've chosen you. Why? Based on all of my analysis, I think we can have the biggest impact on your company. Right away, you might want to misuse the term flattery, but the audience is flattered by this, as long as you can back it up. They're flattered by the fact that you are divulging that you've studied 10 companies, including them. And the next slide needs to be proof that you have actually studied them to back up your claim that you picked them to call on. And when they see the next slide, 
and this is a working example that I really, really, I really mean this. I know a lot of people drop the phones when they hear this. The second slide should be the income statement of the company you're calling on. Their income statement. Their income statement. And the audience is going to look at this and go, well, nobody's ever shown me my own income statement before. I wonder where this is going. <laughs> and you've already jumped the shark. You are now already distinguished yourself from the other audience. And you say to them, you know, this income statement of yours is very, comp not more complicated than anyone else's, but it's a complicated document. There's only three numbers on this income statement that matter. Your revenue, your cost of goods sold, and your earnings that you make at the end of the year. Those are the three biggest numbers that you got to deal with. And we're here to affect revenue, we're here to affect cost of goods sold, or we're here to affect your earnings. One of those or two of those or all three of those. Because on an income statement, if the revenue stays the same and the cost of goods sold as the biggest example goes down, that means the earnings go up. It's just math. If revenue goes up and cost of goods sold doesn't go up, then your earnings go up. It's just math. And you know what happens when earnings go up? Every single time, when earnings go up, your stock price goes up. And people may say to you, how do you know that? I mean, it's self-evident. That's why people buy stock because earnings go up, which drives the price up. So that's the, I think, the way one can distinguish themselves in the sales cycle. Now, what's the benefit of this? You will have A. You will have made informed, credible friends with the business people that you're talking to who you didn't used to talk to because you were only talking to the technology side. Those people are going to start taking you seriously. And as anybody has brought into your confidence, when you start taking people on the other side of the conversation seriously, you begin to open up. It's a natural. You begin to open up and start talking about your real problems and what you really hope to accomplish. So that's the second big thing. You're getting better information out of the audience because they see you're somebody who's invested time in them in order to have an opportunity to sell something to them. They know you're trying to sell something. I mean, we know you're in the store to get a haircut. Everybody understands that equation, but they're going to be listen, they're going to be talking to you more candidly than they would have otherwise. And have and another reason I know that is nobody calls on these people. You ever hear a pretty girl complain, nobody asked me to the prom? Well, I don't know if that really happens, but we see it in romance movies. The business side isn't getting called on it unless the technology people take you there. Forget that paradigm. You get to talk to the business people directly by being literate in their business. So you're going to get better information, you're going to get it quicker, and you're going to find yourself not competing for the bits and bobs that are true between you and the other 10 vendors, you're going to find yourself getting to a success rate, getting to close faster than you would have otherwise. And I submit by talking to the business side, you're going to find more deals at the same company because you've expanded the audience that you're talking to. So that's just a thumbnail of benefits that can accrue down to the sales teams if, in fact, they're going to take this business approach to selling as opposed to the classic, a more classical approach. I hope that helps. Katie. Yeah, it does. I think that's really insightful and definitely a good taster for those that are listening that perhaps want your services as well. So where do you see your business going in the future? Ah, this is the best question of all. <laughs> Let me start out, and I hinted at this earlier about artificial intelligence. Okay, so artificial intelligence has become the great enabler across the entire business spectrum. With sales training, having a pride of place in the mix. And I'm going to prove that. For instance, with AI, we can't even see the outside boundaries. Finding where AI does not apply is much more difficult than the reverse. Let me elaborate, Katie. Traditionally, all go-to-market teams treated the sales funnel as the most relevant graphically, graphical representation of the go-to-market process. All, funnel, all funnels are universally viewed as fat at the top and narrow at the bottom. 
But my particular training turns that paradigm on its head. And I was alluding to this just a few minutes ago. Let's just take the US market as a working example. In the US stock market of publicly traded companies, it's divided into 11 generally well-known sectors. And these would include financials, real estate, <clears throat> consumer discretionary, information technology, industrials, materials, consumer staples, healthcare, energy, communication services, and utilities. And every salesperson at every technology everywhere in the world is calling on companies that fall into these 11 sectors. Now, those 11 sectors represent just over 6,000 actively traded stocks, any of which that could be assigned to a salesperson at any given time. So now back to the top of the funnel. If you start capturing 5,000 contacts, which is not unusual for a sales team and marketing team, contacts, suspects, and leads at the top of the funnel, that may drop down to 50 at the bottom with some modicum of success. But from the 5,000 to get to the bottom, it'll take years, months, if not years, before all that happens. My, pro my process is predicated on narrow funnels at the top. So instead of 5,000 going in at the top, how about only the 50 going in at the top? And those 50 would be highly qualified. And here's the punchline, through heavy use of AI and hands-on versus machine research and informed qualitative analysis. Those three things together is what I do for a living. Take AI, also use hands-on research, and I perform qualitative analysis. So if a company has a sales funnel and they want me to evaluate it, I might say to them, okay, you've got 100 records in here that you're going to go after. Do you know 30 of these records are flat broke? These companies don't have any money. Well, how would you know that, Dennis? Well, <laughs> it ain't the revenue line, that's for sure. Just because people have revenue doesn't mean they have money to spend. We all know that from days of living paycheck to paycheck, right? But if you qualify records, and that was just one crude example, who has money and who doesn't, you will streamline your process of how to get to your wins much, much faster. So that's, in summary, where I expect my business to take me, a new paradigm for sales teams to greatly improve their close ratios and their speed to close the deals as well. So let me plant the flag here on the x-axis. All I've described right now is the x-axis of my business. This is the customer side. These are my customers. My customers are technology companies, sales and marketing teams. Their customers are the 11 sectors of the stock market. They're selling to those people. I'm not, I'm selling to technology companies, sales and marketing people. And those tech companies could be any size from startup right through the giant behemoths, as I said earlier today. But on the Y axis, the Y axis are my partners. I am a perfect fit for two different constituents. Now I'm not talking about my customers. I've already described that. But my partner constituents, two types, venture capital firms, they have a portfolio, of port, a portfolio of companies that they are invested in and they want to be pro, a proactive talent hub for those within the family. So Sequoia, one of the biggest venture capital firms in the planet, hundreds of technology companies in their portfolio and let's say Sequoia wants to be a talent hub for them. And so they could use me to help any or all of those individual companies on an individual basis. That's the first one. The other one, and this is a relatively recent phenomenon, are the fractional CMOs. <clears throat> first of all, why are there so many fractional CMOs? Well, there's fractional CMOs because marketing budgets got cut. And so people have left their traditional jobs and they're out now doing very qualified fractional CMO work. 
<clears throat> and fractional CMOs are also intent to build out their business. And so many of them have said to me, I want, you know, I need to, or I'd like to add and what I consider an impactful and complementary sales training module to their own go-to-market value propositions. So they use me as a module to plug in. Hey, we do this, we write content, we design websites, we produce go-to-market programs, we, and, and the list goes on. Fractional CMOs do all of those things. We do social media, but now we also have a sales training module, which is predicated on change your arguments, change your audience. So that's my second natural ally, allied you know, partners that I work with. So both of these business types can include me into their businesses, like plugging in an iPhone to get its battery fully charged up. And there's no competition between what I do and what any of them do. So I've spent time explaining my windows on Wall Street and marketing trainings. Basically, I teach how to hunt. And it's complemented by my aligned go-to-market sales with an edge, where I actually hunt for the sales team by qualifying their funnels by supplying a funnel if required and sharing relevant go-to-market messaging with marketing to adapt for their prospecting. So Katie, I think in a nutshell, that's where I see my business growing. I, I, have, I have got my arms wrapped around uh, and ring fenced a value proposition go-to-market solution that is relatively underutilized. I can't say no company does, no technology company doesn't do stock analysis in order to get their job, but I haven't found any and I've worked for a number of them and they weren't doing this kind of work in order to help their sales teams. And so I see my, my business continuing to grow on its own two feet by selling to my customers, technology sales and marketing teams, as well as my aligned partners of venture capital firms and fractional CMOs. I, I know I love talking about this and you know, like the mom said to the kid who came home from school, uh, the kid said, I didn't do well on my exam. She says, what happened? He goes, I failed. And she says, what was the exam about? And the kid tells her and she says, well, that's what your father does for a living. Why didn't you ask him about this stuff? And the kid just says, I didn't want to know that much. And I hope I haven't bent too many ears in your audience and that they found us of interest, Katie. Oh, no, I'm sure they definitely will. And it's interesting to hear where you, where you plan to go in the future as well and using that partnership model too. Um, so how if people want to continue to follow your journey and your story, how do they um, go about doing so? How, how do they follow you? Have you got any links to YouTube, et cetera? Right. My, so I'm Dennis Roman one on YouTube. OK, not Dennis Rodman one. Right. Don't, don't go to YouTube. <laughs> if you go to YouTube and type Dennis Roman, you're not going to find me because all you'll get is Dennis Rodman. But I'm up on YouTube. I got a lot of video up there on Dennis Roman one. My website is www.romansnumbers.com. So there's a lot of information there. And a lot of information is up on LinkedIn as well. <clears throat> my email is Dennis at RomansNumbers.com. And my phone is 954-806-6660. Might just give one last plug, uh, Katie. Um, I do have my next Magic Money Workshop coming up on Leap Year's Day, February 29th. It only happens every four years. And so 9 a.m. Eastern time, I got my next money market. Uh, Magic Money Workshop, and it's going to be on why the equity analysts, not the Gartners, not the uh, Foresters, but the equity analysts, the Bank of America, the Merrill Lynch, the ABN AMRO, why those equity analysts should be sales and marketing's best digital friends. It's going to be, I'm sure, a very informative session if anybody wants to get into it. Just check my LinkedIn profile and there's invites everywhere. Thank you, Katie. Thank you very much. I think I've signed up myself for that one. So I look forward to that. Thank you Wonderful. once again. 
Thank you once again, Dennis, for joining me. It's been great uh, listening to your story and, and how you're getting on with your business and what it does. And I'm sure there'll be lots of listeners out there that are really interested. Um, and we'll put all the links that you've described in the show notes below as well so they can get in touch with you. All right, Katie, I'm delighted to have had the opportunity. Um, uh, it's just wonderful. It's very generous of you to give me the opportunity today. And, um, don't, and I want to tell your audience, don't be a stranger. You got a question. You got my number. Call me up. Um, you want to do a, a discovery with Dennis on Thursday? Just send me a ticker symbol and I'll study it and I'll get back to you and tell you what I think of that company. But not for buying it. I don't teach people how to buy stock. That's not what I do. <laughs> I don't want to come across as anyone who is promoting any individual stock. No, we'll All put right, that in as well. Thank you very much, Dennis. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Learning Reinvented podcast. We hope you enjoyed it. If you've not already done so, please follow our podcast. And if the learning effect can help you and your organisation, please do get in touch. You can find both James and Katie on LinkedIn and our contact details are in the show notes below.